Okay, everyone, here we are. We're just about a half a minute early getting started, but I wasn't sure how long it would take to get everything organised here. We seem to be going okay. So I just want to say um, good morning to everyone. I've got two computers going here just in case something goes wrong. But today I want to talk to you about aquaponics in general and our aquaponics design course in particular. So I'm going to invite questions. So as this uh, shows up on our Facebook page, and I'll just check with my other computer here to see if it's live. Yeah, it should be. Uh, we'll just see what happens. And it's saying we're live, but I can't see it yet. So maybe there's some kind of delay. I'm not sure about that. <clears throat> see what happens here for a second or two. <clears throat> yep, we're, we're underway. So what I'd like you to do as we proceed is to post some questions there in the normal way that you would do in a um, in a Facebook post and, and uh, I'll attempt to answer them as we go along. I can see one already. Your audio is good. Thank you for that, Chad. Uh, Jonathan Sands is there. You're all good. Thanks, Jonathan. You commented a few minutes ago about it was okay. Robert, thanks, Robert. Transmitting fine. That's great. I'd love to see that. It's always good to know that we're actually online and actually working there. So, um, yeah, so I want to just, uh, first of all, take you through some of the things we've done uh, around the world in, in aquaponics, uh, some home systems and also some um, some commercial systems. So I'll just see, I just hope this works for us. Yes, there it is. Can you see that? Can you see the new practical aquaponics thing out there on, online on screen? Because <clears throat> someone can tell me. Are we seeing that there? Anish says, good morning. Came to your course in Brisbane 2016. That's great. Yep, good on you, Robert. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, now we're going to just run through this very quickly and we'll, we'll see how we go with it. Um, yep. All right, I just want to show you some home systems in the backyard that students have built and that we've built in various places. Thanks for all the comments. Mike, Edgar, uh, Odinez, Frank Kapinski. Yeah, he's there. Frank can see it. Frank, by the way, just a heads up to Frank. Frank's the guy that does all that videoing for us and all the fantastic editing and a lot of our marketing as well. So that's the team. It's not just me. We've got a great team uh, with us that make it all happen. Okay, aquaponics at home in the backyard. Now, I just want to show you, um, these are some of the things that we teach in the course. Um, in the aquaponics design course, we start right at the very beginning of aquaponics, right the very, if you're an absolute beginner and you don't know the first thing about it, we start right from there and we work our way through home systems, larger home systems that could be used in a school, for example, and right through to very, very large scale um, aquaponics farming. So first of all, we'll just show you the pine kit. Now, this one we feature in our lessons and um, that picture's not real good. It's a bit blurry on my screen. I hope it's better on yours. We'll go to the next one. Uh, this is what it's like and it, it, it actually enables you to incorporate in this area here. This is one that we built at a little training course we did down in central New South Wales. I think it was Coonabarabran, I think. Uh, we went there to do that about a year and a half or two years ago. And uh, you can see this part is the floating raft part. This part here, when it's filled up, is the media bed part. And of course, the fish tank can be, in this case, it's an IBC, but it can be a variety of small fish tanks that make up the fish tank. That's a fantastic little kit to put in, you know, even a very small backyard that will fit into. And in the, in the aquaponics design course, I think we've got four or five videos on that that show you how to, const how to construct it step by step. We also have within the course a bill of quantities for that. So you'll know what timber to go and buy, what lining to buy, and all that kind of thing. Uh, isn't that great? Look at that. And there's another one. This is, the, this is actually the one we built to film. This is the end product of the filming we did uh, for, for the course. And you can see that's a really nice, tidy little kit. But I can give you one tip on it if you decide to build one. It's probably a good idea to paint the timber first with some kind of wood preservative or some kind of varnish or whatever kind of finish you want because over time the sun makes the pine go quite dark grey, which some of you might not mind, but if it's um, in a backyard, um, it might not look as good as you'd like it to look in the long run. Hello, Mark. How are you? And Terence, nice to see you guys logging in. <clears throat> Okay, then we step up one one or two steps to uh, the Indie um, series of systems we have. And uh, hello, Rob. Um, the Indie 11.5, which we feature very strongly in our aquaponics design course, 
We actually give you a complete set of plans for that, the Indy 11.5 in the course, um, right down to, you know, blow, blow, blow description of how to put it together. You know, put this screw in here, put that screw in there, cut this to this length, and that kind of detail. And then the big brother to that is the Indy 23 system. And then, of course, we've had a number of customers and students who've built the Indy 23 twice, side by side, and we call that a Twindy. Now, here's a picture of the Indy 23 system. And this is in our greenhouse. This is the pilot system we built. Uh, it's five years ago, actually, in May. The month's just month of May that's just gone. Uh, this system is five years old, so we've got a long track record now of running the system. And I've got to tell you, we've sold sets of plans around the world for that, almost 400 sets now. And as far as we know, about half of those have been built already. So there's some really good builds going on around the world. It's a well-proven system uh, of doing uh, aquaponics. So there you go. And uh, there's another scene inside it. And the close-up you can see here in the front, uh, that's potatoes growing in the wicking bed part of the system. So the system consists of you know, media beds, raft beds, and a wicking bed. Mark says, thanks for doing this. That's okay, Mark. I get as much fun out as you guys, I can assure you, probably a bit more. But anyway, that's what the Indy 23 looks like. And here's an example of a Twindy, which is just a play on words, really. You know, it's a twin Indy system. And this is one we built for a client uh, not far from where we live here. Uh, this is the build almost complete. You can see it's a nice looking system. And it's two Indy 23s side by side. See, there's the fish tanks for one system. That's one system there. And, of course, you can see this other system here. So, anyone got any comments about that? Where are we based, Roger says. We're based in Queensland, Australia, Roger. That's where we live. And we travel all over the place doing these wonderful things. And here's just another little shot I thought I'd throw in just to show you of a bunch of students uh, where we built an Indy 23 system in Oregon, in the USA. And uh, that's just at the point we'd gotten to where we'd put the liner in the in the bed. Now, uh, part of our lessons in the um, aquaponics design course, we actually show you um, quite a good clear video on how to do liner in beds because it's um, we have it as the preferred method of building things because most people in most places of the world can build something and put liner in it. So we find that that's a good way to go. <clears throat> there are a bunch of students all listening intently, aren't they good? <clears throat> Okay, I want to move now to some farms that we've uh, been involved with. Um, some of our students have gone out and done some absolutely amazing things. Um, this is built by one of our students, Arvind, who came to three of our training courses in the USA. And by the time he'd come to the third one, I was beginning to worry about this guy. I thought, what's going on with him? But anyway, he'd made up his mind that he was going to go out and he was going to make it his job or his career to build aquaponic systems for clients. That's what he was going to do. And right now, at this very point in time, I can tell you he's just finished his 14th farm on behalf of clients. And he's about to start one in Texas in the USA, actually, which is really, really good. But this farm in Hong Kong, um, it's actually owned by another student who actually came to one of the same training courses that Arvind did. And that was in Pascadero, California. And um, they got to know each other. And so um, they got together to build this wonderful farm. So this farm, just look at the numbers there. This farm's been in operation now for three years. The farm had a return on investment of 18 months. How about that? The initial farm build cost 250000 US. They've since done some expansion and some modifications, but it's running very, very well. And the farm sells all of its product online, just like an eBay store. You know, they've got a very good website. And in Hong Kong, because it's a very highly populated place and um, all nice and close together, and there's, of course, a lot of people who are in the upper end of the income bracket, and they can afford to buy high quality produce for their for their um, family. So there you go. Um, it works really well. That sort of thing, just like on eBay. We've got a guy here asking a question. Uh, Ophelia says, "Wish I could build this on my farm area." Thanks for being live. That's okay, mate. I hope we can answer your questions today. Uh, Tetra says in, in New Zealand, "Good day, sir. How can I get grow beds into New Zealand from Australia?" or as a cheaper way. Build them yourself, mate. Don't buy them from us. Um, we realised a long time ago that it's impossible for people to buy stuff from us. And that's the whole idea of this training course, to equip you and empower you to build these things yourself, wherever you are in the world, to discover how 
uh, what kind of materials you need to get, what kind of materials you can get in your area, and the dimensions and the criteria that you need to stick to in order to make it work. That's what the training course is all about. And it's to do it, if you're going to do it at home, the small home one, medium homes, large home, school, all full-scale farm. We cover the whole lot. Here's an inside view of the farm in Hong Kong. Um, there's yours truly there, standing there with Arvind, having a look and discussing things. And you can see there's all kinds of different lettuce and leafy greens growing there. Along this side here, you can see the fans in the wall. It's quite a big greenhouse. Um, here's another shot in that same greenhouse. You can see the, um, here's the tomatoes next door and the beds next door growing. Beautiful greenhouse, producing a lot of stuff and selling it off. And there you go. When the tomatoes grow tall, that's what you've got to do. You've got to get up on a ladder to prune them and trim them, and make sure they're in good condition. See all the tomatoes. You, I hope you can see it clearly on the Facebook page. All the tomatoes there growing really, really well. Look at them. Loaded up with beautiful tomatoes. Wonderful stuff. And just take note, along the front here, that's the water delivery pipe that they've set along there. And it, notice it's all insulated in order to help it, you know, help with temperature control. Because Hong Kong is not a cold place, but it gets quite chilly in winter. Not chilly enough for snow or anything, but it does get um, chilly. So we like to insulate the pipes in those kind of climates to help things a little bit. Um, hi, Alan. This, Alan is in here from the UK. Oh, it's, must be one o'clock in the morning for you over there. <clears throat> Anish says, what specific pipe size do we use? We use fish tank to filter, filter to grow bed and grow bed to sub. Depends on the size of the system in actual fact. Um, if it's a large farm system, we'll be using a 100 millimetre pipe uh, for that kind of thing. If it's a small home system, in many instances, you can use 25 millimetre pipe. That's one inch in Imperial. Or you can use inch and a half, which is 40 millimetre and so on, So, uh, and in some places, 20 millimetre. In the plans we give you in the system, we specify all those sizes for the particular ones. Um, I have, Tetris says, I have a two metre square grow bed out of plywood and fibreglass. I can't wait to start the course. Fantastic. Well, if you're already on your way, that's great. Um, Andrew asks, hi, Murray, do you need a greenhouse? No, you don't, you don't need one, but you're jolly well smart if you do have one. Because we live in a period of time in the world where, um, you know, we're seeing more extreme weather events. And so protected cropping is definitely the way of the future. Uh, and that is to protect your crops. So if you're doing a small home system, lots of people do it outdoors and they have good results. But you'll always get much better results if you um, have it under cover. Now we've got here another question. Fernando says, I love aquaponics, but I'm considering going vegan. So I'd like to know if... Carp would be a good choice and how long they live and how easy it would be to feed them, take care of them. Yes, uh, Fernando, because aquaponics produces pure food in the strictest sense of the word, we have lots of uh, hardcore vegetarians, hardcore vegans that do aquaponics. And they do it because of the methodology. And yes, you can use carp. Carp live for a very long time. I'll tell you what, we've got a few students who are vegans and they grow um, koi, high quality koi. And they actually make a lot of money out of the koi, out of that fish side of the business. They'll never eat the fish in a million years, but they're selling those beautiful koi fish to uh, people who love that kind of thing. And they're making good money out of that side of the business as well. So there you go. That's I hope that answers your question. Um, following on to the greenhouse question, does, does rain cause disturbance in the system water? Yes, it does. Um, and if that's the main reason why you need a greenhouse in my part of the world anyway, because where we live in Brisbane, we actually have a pretty good climate. Our winters are, are not really all that cold, but we believe in having greenhouses because we get very, very heavy summer rains. And when we get summer rain, that gets into the system. The fish don't care if they get lots of nice fresh water. They don't care at all, but it dilutes the um, nutrient in the system and therefore, you know, the system gets knocked around a bit because of that. But I just stress, if you're in a home, if you've got a really small backyard somewhere in suburbia, and you really can't put up a greenhouse of some sort, don't be deterred by that. Still go ahead. You'll still get fantastic results, much better than you would in an ordinary regular garden. Um, Tetra says, my goal is to go, go commercial. Fantastic. That's good. Um, Rob says, the training course has been well worth. Oh, Rob, you're a student, are you? Good on you, Rob. Thanks for saying that. We like it when students get in and give us a bit of a wrap. It's good. Um, are you watching from, Sonia's watching from the Philippines. Terrific. It's amazing to have this worldwide audience. What a fantastic time in history we live in. You know, we did a, Frank and I did a count up just the other day, 
and we discovered that for the aquaponics design course to date, we've had students from 93 countries. Can you believe that? 93 countries. Unbelievable. It just goes to show that uh, the worldwide interest there is in aquaponics. Uh, Fernando says, would Koi be able to live in Brazil? Yes, of course. They can get them anywhere in the world. They're part of the carp family. You need to investigate that, Fernando. It's a really good thing to do. Charlie Harper asks, that Hong Kong system looks huge. Yes, 2,200 square metres. I'm sorry, I just can't remember what that is in square feet. I think I put it on here. Up here at the front here. Did I? Yes, 24,000 square feet. There you go. Um, <clears throat> Robin says you are there as Sammy. That, okay, fair enough. Hi from M.A. in Mantra, Ecuador. Miguel, hello, Miguel. Um, uh, I finished the FCR of koi fish now. I'm, I'm not too sure, but I think it's around about two. And that is um, between one and a half and two, which most freshwater fish are. Uh, Jeff's put up a two minute video worth watching. I don't know what that's about, but I'll have a click on it later on and see what it's worth, Jeff. Uh, see if it's worth watching. I'm sure if you recommend it, it's probably pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> There's more tomatoes, beautiful tomatoes being grown in, uh, oh, Monza, M-O-N-Z-E-R, watching Gaza from Gaza in, Philistine, in Palestine. Good on you. Nice to see people from that part of the world. Uh, Stuart says, having a high pH, can't get down. It's running at 8.2. The system has been running for two weeks. The rock was tested and it's fine. Stuart, be patient. It takes time to get it to come down. It really, really does. Sometimes it can take weeks and weeks and weeks. But look, let me give you a little tip here for everyone. Uh, if you've got high pH, you're likely to have your plants exhibit um, shortage of iron. They will appear as if they're iron deficient. The best iron to use is E-double-D-H-A. That's E-double-D-H-A. E-double-D-H-A can be taken up by the plants at quite high pH ranges. So don't be deterred by that. Use that. Make sure you get some. We've got it on our website if you live in Australia, and you can get it there. Uh, next question, Anthony says, I'm thinking of starting my farm a few hours north of where you are, based after I did the upcoming course. Yeah, good on you. In your area, do you find that you have to have much input to manage temperature fluctuations within the greenhouse? Well, Anthony, it depends how far north you are from me, but where I live, I'm south of Brisbane, and we have enough winter here just to be a nuisance, to be honest with you. But our winters are not, they're not winters, not when you consider the winters that some people have in places like, you know, uh, Oregon in, U in, in the USA and Canada and places like that. Jesse says, your course is amazing. My friend and I are setting up one for a middle school and get the grant, a grant to help. We went to teach the kids. We want to teach the kids. We finished the greenhouse floor today. After that, I want home system, eventually considering going commercial. We're in Washington State. Nice. Good on you, Jesse. You do get some cold weathers, uh, cold uh, winters in Washington State. Um, we've got quite a few students out of Washington, actually, that have um, come to our online course and also to our face-to-face courses we've run in Oregon. Okay, back to this. Um, where are we up to? Yeah, look at these beautiful tomatoes. You know, some people say, oh, you can't grow tomatoes in aquaponics. Well, yes, you can. Have a look at that. Notice they're grown in media beds um, because tomatoes like to have something in contact with their roots. And there's some good reasons for that that we discuss in the course. Some good reasons for that, why that's uh, important. Look at those beautiful tomatoes. I reckon tomatoes, most important crop you can possibly have. Okay, and there's cucumbers. Look at that. Beautiful Lebanese cucumbers. And there they are hanging there and growing. You can see this. See here, there's new ones coming on. Um, new ones coming on there. Just flowered. And so on we go. <clears throat> okay. Now I wanted to switch to a farm that was built by Arvind of Water Farmers in um, Oman. The initial build was 600 square metres, that's 6,500 square feet. This was a pilot project to see if aquaponics could get through the Middle Eastern summers. Summer temperatures, now, some of you that live in other parts of the world might find this hard to believe, but 50 degrees C, which is 122 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty much an average summer day in Oman. They have a few stinking hot ones which get up to 55 degrees C, which is 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That is unbelievably hot. So naturally enough, the investors were really keen to have it proved to them that the system would work um, in a very hot climate, and it did. 
and they got through the first summer really, really well, produced crops all the way through, and then they expanded it to one acre. Uh, so, yeah, wonderful farm. I've been there twice, actually. I've been privileged to go there twice. I'll just show you some shots from it. This is inside the farm. Have a look at the construction of the greenhouse. Very, very high, and that's important in, in a hot climate. So the hot air's got time to rise and go out and also create a draft in here. This particular photograph was taken when I went back for the second time. And you can see the this is I'm standing in the first 600 square metre area. You can see all the lush, beautiful greens growing there. When I was there for that, we were in, actually in the middle of their winter, which was uh, lovely temperatures, actually, um, 28, 29 degrees. But there you go. And you can see the new growth in the background here of the new section. You can vaguely see the, the new buildings that added on to make it up to one acre in size. It's a beautiful thing. Um, okay, here we go. There's some more shots of the um, 600 square metre size and the fish tank right in the foreground there. And here we go again, more shots of the 600 square metre grow here. See all these beautiful greens. Um, we've got over here kale. We've got here a thing they grow there very successfully in, and they call it a summer spinach. I'm not quite sure what the botanical name of that is. I need to find out because it's a wonderful crop to grow in a hot climate. And you, of course you've got Swiss chard in the front here of all different kinds. I don't know what happened there, but we for somehow we dropped for some reason we dropped out. I'm sorry. I hope we're back online again. And you can see. Can someone just tell me if you can see us again? For some reason it just dropped out. Good old internet. Can you see continuous? Um, Anisha asks, can you see continuous flow in media beds? Um, yep, yep. Everyone can see us. That's great. I was really worried we'd lost we'd lost the plot there. So you can see stuff. Great. I don't know why it dropped out, but it did. But anyway, there you go. Um, yes, there was a question back there, which I can't seem to get back to, about can you use continuous flow in media beds with air diffusers? No. No, sorry, totally unnecessary. And just it's just it's totally unnecessary because the, the media beds flood and drain. And in flooding and draining, when, the, when it floods, the uh, nutrient-rich water comes in. And when it drains, um, as the water leaves the bed, air... Atmospheric pressure forces air down uh, through the gravel and oxygen is delivered to all the plant roots. So no, you don't even consider that. Look, I know, Anish, I've seen some silly people on YouTube advocating that idea. You've got to be very careful watching YouTube clips. You get people on YouTube that have been doing aquaponics for about five or seven minutes and they decide they're going to put a YouTube clip up and make all sorts of claims. And for when you've been around as long as I have, you often see the pictures they're using are stolen ones from somebody else's website. I actually haven't done aquaponics at all, a lot of them, and they just want to be a hero. Sorry for saying that, but there's some really bad information in YouTube clips. <clears throat> okay, another shot of this beautiful farm. This dude here, I can't say his name. He's an Indian guy, really talented farm manager. He looks after the farm there in Oman with a staff of about six people. They do a great job. Okay, and here's some shots of the expansion. The first trip we went there to Oman, Frank and I went there to film. And uh, this is some shots of the expansion, which has just been freshly planted up with tomatoes, you can see. And, of course, you can see the multiple systems within the greenhouse. So the whole place is modularised. Uh, each system has got uh, six tanks. And then, you know, there's the filters for it. And on and on it goes to get right up and around the corner here. Beautiful big system. Okay, and here's uh, the trip we went back to uh, the second time I went back uh, on my own. And there's some shots of the new growth in the new system between when I went there the first time and the second time. And there's Frank and I when we were there the first time in Oman. Uh, you can see here in the background that the system at this particular point has not been planted up, the new part of the system. But you can see it's quite expensive. You see, notice the roof height over where the plants are. We've got uh, semi, semi clear. Um, PVC roofing on here, and down here the lower section over where the fish tanks are has got uh, light, you know, preventing the light from getting to the fish water. So that's best for the fish, and uh, there you are, you can see how it's been built. They plan, they told us when I was there last time, they plan to build this area out as well. They're doing so well with it. <clears throat> okay, then we went and visited another farm in Bangalore, once again built by Arvin, beautiful farm. One acre, built one acre straight up, 43,500 square feet. Uh, the farm is built in five different modules within the greenhouse to make up one big farm. The farm sells all of its produce to high-end restaurants and individual buyers. And they have that down to a pretty fine art. 
And uh, these shots were taken when the farm had only been running for about five months, about five months into production. And look at the interesting thing here. We've got our fish tanks, filters, and modules. You can see the modules. That's the overhead tank, the header tank, for the first one, second one, and so on, as it goes down the line. So there's five individual systems within that greenhouse. Just see here the pump, the pump system to pump the water up out of the sump, up to the header tank or distribution tank. And there's the filters, more filters, and so on. And this is um, Gayatri. She's Arvin's wife. Lovely young lady, and she's quite a talent actually, she does a lot of the admin work. There's another shot from another direction, you can see looking out over, look at those beautiful lettuce, look at them, all of them. Um, we've got Swiss chard growing here, we've got kale, you know, and on and on it goes to try and satisfy the needs of customers. Look at that kale. Now this is in, this particular photograph is taken in the very end one of the new expansion when I went back there the second time. And this large kale bed, they were harvesting out of that 100 kilos of kale a week. How about that? That's 220 pounds a week just out of those kale beds. And look at the quality of it. Absolutely beautiful stuff. Glorious. Um, farm in South Korea. Now, these are a couple of students that came down and did our face-to-face -face course down here in Brisbane. And then they decided they'd go back from the course and do a farm there in, um, in, in South Korea. Uh, just look at these numbers here. They've got seven separate greenhouses at the moment. It totals 161,000 square feet for people who are thinking in square feet, or 15,000 square metres. Now, this is a big, big farm, and they're doing exceptionally well. When we were there, I asked him, could we disclose the turnover? He told us what it was. He said, yeah, you can tell people we don't mind. 1.2 million US dollars per month, staff of 60 employees. So that gives you an idea how big you can go with an aquaponics farm if you really want to. Um, these guys are doing extraordinarily well. You know, I'm always absolutely humbled by the really smart students we get. They're just such smart people. They go, they go away from a training course, they do our aquaponics design course, and they go away and they do amazing things. <clears throat> There's a picture of the staff. Got all the staff together for a photograph when Frank and I went there. There's Frank. There's wonder he hasn't got his camera in his hand. And there's yours truly in front there and the dog mascot of the company. And that's one of the owners, Aaron. And there's his partner there, his business partner. I just can't say his name. Sorry, it's a Korean name, but lovely young men and got a wonderful staff. Beautiful. And we're inside one of the glass greenhouses. This is glass. It's been there for a number of years. They've taken over a number of these greenhouses and uh, taken out leases on them. And this particular one has, and you can just make out in the photograph, that's their office block in the background here. And to the right here, we've got their um, staff restaurant, and they've got that built in under the greenhouse. Because in, in South Korea, where they are located, just outside of Seoul, they get temperatures of minus 20 degrees C. Now, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's probably about minus, something like minus 20 as well. But someone who's quick on a calculator might be able to work it out or look it up on, on Google. Uh, but this particular greenhouse, just as an add-on to their business, now you can't see it in this photograph, but they've got all tables set up all the way through here, and they're starting to do uh, catering for weddings. What a great idea. There's all sorts of things you can add onto your business. You don't just have to be doing straight aquaponics. These are the two guys together there, Aaron Park and his business partner, and yours truly. You can just see Frank's face there. We took a shot inside their wonderful restaurant, and we, we were there in uh, just, I think it was autumn or spring, I can't remember which, but it was about a year ago now we were there. Uh, here we go, some shots inside it. Beautifully designed, um, well-built system. All these media beds, all these, sorry, raft beds, they had especially built for them. You can see they've got a trolley here that runs on railway tracks down the middle so they can move the plants around easily. Highly organised, very, very well organised. Here's another shot of one of the staff members putting the foam uh, pads into the uh, raft in that particular place, uh, ready to receive the plants. You can see new plants here that have been put out from the nursery area. There's more shots, massive greenhouse. And you can just see in the background here the fish tanks. You see the blue one over there, another blue one over here. I wanted to show you this photograph because it actually gives you a, a bit of a vision of the expanse of the size of the different greenhouses they have. And this is an interesting thing here. Because it's so cold, just have a look at this here. We've, we took a lot of film of this and we talk a lot of, about it in our aquaponics design course. But they've got these three layers of blankets that are all automatic. 
So when it gets when it's winter time in the daytime, it's a sunny day. They open these blankets up, and of course you get sun radiation comes in here. Even if even if it's minus twenty outside, you'll get a lot of heat will come through in here and heat up the greenhouse. They have it all automatic. So when the sun starts to go down and the temperature starts to drop, these blankets come across and close up the top. And you can see them all the way along here. And the sides blankets come down and close up the sides, and the ends the whole thing gets blanketed up. Three layers of very thick blanketing, and they told us when we were there that they do have gas heating for the whole place, but in uh, two years of operation, they've not used it because the blankets are so effective. They've not had to use the heating. And of course, up in the top here are vents that are also automatic. So if the temperature inside the greenhouse gets above 27 degrees C, those vents open automatically and vent the place. So there you go, a high-tech greenhouse that can operate in an environment that goes from in the summertime, you know, um, 38, 40 degrees C, which is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right the way through to minus 20. So huge temperature variations they operate very successfully in. Another shot. Here's the railway track. I've always wanted to have my own railway line. There you go. Look at that. Beautiful, wonderful stuff. <clears throat> One of the fish tanks, just to show you that it is an aquaponic system and they do have fish tanks. Quite a large fish tank and we'll give you all the numbers about that in the aquaponics design course. And here we're sitting eating in, in the in the beautiful restaurant. Look at that, staff restaurant. Um, and I just got to tell you, uh, being an Australian, I was quite amazed at this because their standard work day in South Korea is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's the standard work day. Here in Australia, uh, we don't want to get to work till 9 and we want to go home at 3 most of the time, but there you go. So there you go. And they have provide breakfast, lunch and dinner for their staff in, in, the, in the staff um, restaurant. You know, they come in in batches of 20 people and they get fed by, they've got a chef on board, some kitchen staff, and they cook beautiful meals. A lot of it comes out of the greenhouses, of course, a lot that they can, and uh, beautiful meals. I thought that was pretty good. We had there a couple of times, Frank and I, we had a great time. Another shot of um, some other plants growing. This, you'll notice these are in bigger net pots, and this has uh, got four or five plants to each net pot, and those plants are all cut and they go into a salad mix. We talk about that extensively, how to do that kind of thing in our aquaponics design course. There you go, more of the same. Uh, we've got different kinds of greens growing in the front here and see the size of the greenhouse. And just right there at the back, you might be able to make it out, I'm not sure. You can see uh, the blue uh, fish tanks there at the back. <clears throat> Here's just a shot to throw into you to show you that you can actually grow bananas in aquaponics. This was taken at a farm I visited in Portugal. Wonderful people there in Portugal, got a fantastic aquaponics business going. And when I first got there, I walked into this greenhouse and I could not believe what I was seeing. I was seeing this massive banana grove growing inside the greenhouse. And when I was there, it was just, just uh, towards the end of winter. And it was still quite, quite cool. But to imagine having bananas growing in an aquaponic system. And you can see down here, they've got them growing in baskets filled with clay pebbles, which are sitting inside a trough. And so they're watered continuously and drained continuously. And that's how they've got the bananas growing. You'll also notice this tree trunk here, that's a papaya or pawpaw tree. And uh, yeah, wonderful stuff. So some aquaponics farms in the USA. There's, there's literally, well, I don't really know how many, but there's probably, there's probably be more than 100 farms actually running now in the USA. Most of them are what we would call mom and pop farms. That's how they say it in the USA, or mum and dad farms which is really the farm model that has been the most popular for the last hundred years or more, where you'll have a farm that is run by the family. Mum and dad both work the farm and the kids will grow up and work the farm. And I believe that's the farm model that will prove ultimately to be most successful around the world. Um, we've shown you the farm in Korea, which we would have to call a very big farm, certainly much bigger than a family enterprise. Uh, but that's uh, in, in South Korea, so you can go that big. But I think if you're interested in farming, uh, the farm model of a mum and dad style farm is really, really good. And here's one I just want to mention, Ouroboros Farms in Half Moon Bay, California. Um, the the owner's there. His name's gone right out of my head. I'm sorry right at this moment. But um, Ken, Ken Armstrong is his name. If you're in the USA and you want to visit a farm, far, Ken is one of the few farmers that will actually take visitors to his farm. So ring them, Ouroboros Farms, write that down. And if you're there, go and see Ken, tell him Murray sent you. Uh, nice man, very helpful, and run a successful aquaponics farm there in Half Moon Bay, California, in the USA. 
Okay, the vision for us for the future is to have a training center in the USA. We want to be able to do that so we can go to the USA a bit more often and train people um, hands face to face, which is an add on to our uh, wonderful system we have, our aquaponics design course. Now, I want to talk to you just before we wrap up because we've we're working away here. There's our aquaponics design course. Now, we get questions every day. We're opening for registration this time on July the 1st, which is only a few days away. Today's the 27th, so three days hence we'll be opening for registrations. Now, this is not sales talk. We only open until we get the number we want or we need, because obviously I have to answer questions, and believe you me, when it's in full swing, I'm busy around the clock, get up in the middle of the night to answer questions and so on from students, so we can only take so many students, the students I can manage. And so if you want to be involved in this course, jump in early and register early. Um, July the 1st, it will open. Uh, that's July the 1st in Queensland time, Australia. For those of you in America, that will be around about 8 o'clock Saturday night and other parts of the world. Anyway, July the 1st, you, you get in there and do it and you'll be okay. So <clears throat> there we go. It's going to run to the 2nd of September. Complete eight-week online course designed managing and maintaining your own aquaponics system. Now, this is the PDF file you can download if you go to our website, which is aquaponicsdesigncourse.com. That's one long word, aquaponicsdesigncourse.com. You can go there and you can uh, you can look, download this particular PDF file. It's only about eight or nine pages, so it's not a big deal to download. And it tells you what the course is all about and that how you can watch it, and look, I've had a lot of questions just today, actually, from people who are wondering, um, do they have to be in a certain time log on? No, you don't. When you're doing the course, you can log on when it suits you best. Because we have the course broken up into eight weeks. So we open the first week, we open the videos. Like As soon as you register, the moment you register and pay, automatically you'll be sent our login details and you'll be able to get in to week one or module one of the course. Now... We, the way it works is we have one week for registration, so that we're going to give people a chance to register, unless we closed off earlier, of course. And then because that is that is the beginning when we close it off of the first week, then it will run for a whole week on that system. So in some instances, if you register really early on, on, on July the 1st, uh, you will see week one for two weeks. I know that can be a bit, bit of a problem for some people. They want to move on with it, but that's how it works. And then week two, we open up week two, and so on it goes through the eight-week course. So that's how it works. <clears throat> um, many benefits of aquaponics. We go through that in the PDF document. But what I want to get down to is just to um, show you the course content because I'm sure many of you are wondering about that. Um, there we go. That's just a bit outtakes from the course showing the set of plans, what they're like, that you download. Uh, there's that beautiful uh, pine kit again. Uh, actually, we've got a few giveaways we give away. These are our DVDs that uh, Frank and I have made. We, start, we did this first one, Aquaponics Made Easy, nearly eight years ago. It's been out there. I don't know how many thousands of those we've sold and gone out. You may have a set of them, I don't know. But actually, we give them away free as a downloadable, not as something that's posted to you, I want to say that, because we found that it's not wise for us to try and post DVDs all around the world because some of them get lost, particularly in places like South Africa where the postal system is not that good, uh, but they're there as downloadable as part of the course. It's one of the bonuses you get, and of course one of the other bonus you get is the set of Indy 11.5 plans. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Um, plan sets for that particular thing. I hope this is working for you guys out there. Can someone tell me you're still seeing everything okay? Okay, course curriculum. Here we go. Um, we estimate that if you do three hours per week, you'll be okay. You'll be able to do it if people want to know how much time it requires. Um, but look, I, I try and encourage you to see this as a study. It's study. It's not just a watch as many videos as you can in a day, you know, as quickly as you can. Because the people that do that, some people jump in and they watch all the videos, they go right through it quickly, they have a marathon video watching event every week, and they don't actually study it, and then they get to the end of the course they want to put a submission in, and they actually know very little about what's being taught because they haven't studied the material. It's very important. Okay, let's just quickly flick through this. Week one, here we go. We'll just get it up here. You can see week three there. I've got to stop that from doing what it's doing for some reason. It's playing up on me at the moment. Sorry about that. 
try and get it to go down to week one. There we go. Goodness me, I don't know why it's doing this, but anyway, it's having a bit of a freak out. The mouse needs more time to move. There we go. There's there's a bit of a, a bit of a quick look at what's involved in the course, and so on. Oh, something I should point out to you. See, every week we have a downloadable course handbook. Now this is in full color, and if you download it every week, which you should obviously, um, punch it with a three-hole punch and put it into a nice folder. At the end of the course, you'll have about an eighty or ninety page manual, which covers all the stuff in the course. And of course, if you're smart as well. What you'll do is you'll make notes on that each week as you go through each video. You'll make notes because the handbook kind of follows the flow of the videos. So you can actually use it like taking proper class notes so that you can flick back through it at any time and get the information you need. Okay, well that's that's pretty much what it's about and I encourage you to download that uh, PDF file. It's not very big and you can look at it and... Um, see what's involved in the course, which is very, very compre comprehensive. <clears throat> okay, well, we're back to just ordinary old me. We've covered all that, I hope, pretty well now. Has anyone got any questions? It says we've had 138 comments. There haven't been a real lot of those have been questions. Most of them just saying yes, 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 yes. And thank you, thank you, thank you. That's good. Here we go. I've got some questions in here. Sounds like it would also make maintenance more difficult as well as keeping a continuous system running 24-7. I don't know what that's about, Russell. I'm sorry. You, you, I'm, I'm not sure what that's about. Sorry. Hi, I did the ABC last year. I loved it. What salinity will an aquaponic system tolerate? If you use an EC meter, an, an electronic, um, um, what's the word? EC. Sorry. Elect electrical conductivity. I've got it now. Sorry, I had a senior moment there. Electrical conductivity meter. You'll be able to read quite easily what salts in the system, and we say a maximum of one on EC meter. Um, it's amazing actually how tolerant food plants are to salt in the system. They're quite tolerant, uh, except for strawberries and cucumbers. So you can have a bit of salt in the system. But you need to buy actually a spectrometer to measure it exactly because uh, a digital reading might be showing you other things. It'll give you an EC uh, that might be measuring the amount of turbidity in the water, for example. Anything that will cause the electric, electric, electricity be, to be conducted through the water will register on an EC meter, not necessarily just salt although hydroponics people use it quite extensively for that. So that's what you should do, Brett. Okay, how do you know, how do you know which flow will start the siphon? It's by trial and error. Yeah, it is trial and error. Anish, are you a student of the course already? I'm not sure whether you are or not. So we've had an Anish in there anyway. Uh, we cover that in the course quite extensively, how to adjust the um, auto siphon. It's quite easy to do. And I'll give you the rule now if you listen to it. If the auto siphon will not start, you don't have enough water flowing through it. If it will start but will not stop, you've got too much water flowing through it. So you need to be able to adjust it. <clears throat> yes, Dwight, it's going to be it's going to be up on uh, Facebook. You'll be able to watch it. It'll save automatically when we're finished. You'll be able to see it. No worries. Uh, due to internet problems, you're always having internet problems, aren't we? Valerie, uh, hi. Either during this course, either during the course we did, or in a video you posted, you talked about planting a seed in a clay in a clay ball. No, I've never talked about planting seeds in clay balls, Valerie, I'm sorry. I can't find the info now, so could you please tell me where you source these clay-coated seeds? Oh, now I know what you're talking about. You're talking about um, pelletized seeds. Sorry, but yeah, they're a little tiny miniature clay ball that one seed is impregnated in. There's lots of seed companies. I don't know where you are in the world, Valerie, but if you're in the USA, uh, Johnny's Seeds. Johnny's Seeds are the people uh, you can buy seeds from. Now, I'm not particularly advocating them, but if you just do some Googling, you'll find lots of places that sell pelletized seeds. They're not cheap. They're much more expensive than buying regular seeds. And the reason for that is you simply don't waste any because, and if you buy them, there's another company called Rick Schwan, uh, which is worldwide. They're a Dutch company. And uh, they guarantee 99.9% .9 germination of their seeds. So you don't waste seeds. For example, here in Australia, for pelletized um, lettuce seeds, we'll pay about $165 for 5,000 seeds. You might think, oh, that's expensive. But if you sell each each lettuce for $2.50 and you're going to grow 5,000 of them, there's a lot of value of seeds in there. Okay, Valerie, a bit further down. Um, da, 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 da. Ashley says, do you have to clean the media regular? No. Uh, the media, we find, on average, needs to be cleaned about once every two years. 
that's if you've got good filtration in the system as well, so that you're taking out all the really coarse stuff. Uh, Jason says, thanks Murray, love taking your course last year, and we'd love to host you at our farm near Seattle. Oh, I'd love to come to Seattle and see your farm, Jason. Um, must try and remember that. Um, when it's completed next late this year, yes, love to see it. Love to come and visit. It's almost a good enough excuse to go there just to see your farm. Um, Mark, I'm excited to register in your upcoming class. Besides your class, what advice would you give to someone who wants to make a career out of aquaponics? Um, well, we cover that really, really strongly in the class. I think this is what you mean, Mark. At the end of the course in week eight, we give you some very, very elaborate spreadsheets that give you the uh, possibility of being able to do really exact and high quality um, business planning, which is what you need to do. You need to be business planned. You know, unfortunately, we've seen farms where people have had no training and they've gone off half cocked. They get all excited, you know, about doing aquaponics. They don't do any business planning, they don't do any budgeting, and you know, these are the farms that don't do so well. So yeah, we help you with that. Russell, how can we slow down the evaporation rate in drier climates besides monitoring plant aspiration? Uh, do you have any techniques you use or uh, considered? Well, Russell, you can't really slow it down except by good design because you're going to stop evaporation from happening by making sure you've got good plumbing. Uh, you can cover your tanks, you know, with something to make sure that there's not too much evaporation from there. And, of course, all your beds have got foam rafts on them or they're gravel. And the gravel beds, we never flood them right to the top. We always make sure it's 50 mil or two inches down so that we, we you know, we minimise evaporation. There's not much you can do to, to minimise evaporation except those things I've just mentioned. Now, when we're talking about minimising uh, transpiration by the plants, well, you really can't minimise that either because the plants, transpiration is sweating. The plants are sweating. If it's hot, they're trying to keep themselves cool. So that's what they'll do. So if you want to help them be cool, you'll have a really well-designed greenhouse. That's what you'll do. So that you can vent the greenhouse in hot weather. You have good airflow through it. You'll even have fans if you can afford to run them. So that you keep the air temperature as low as possible, as cool as possible. Just like human beings. Same for us in summertime. If we're stinking hot, we're going to sweat. That's what's going to happen. But if we're in a cooler environment because we've got a fan blowing or something, it will, it will go and work really well. Okay, Bill says, I don't know if I'm to your view, uh, lower the water level in the media bed. No, media beds are flooded to within 50 mil of the top and then drained. <clears throat> Jonathan says, do you have any plans to visit Northern, Cal Northern California? Well, I'd love to come back there. I regularly go to Oregon a couple of times a year, uh, but we haven't got any plans to go there just yet. We'll probably go back there September or something like that. That's when we usually go, just when the winter is over. Because, sorry, when the summer is over and it's getting cooler. Um, Charlie says, hey Murray, can you give us a ballpark figure for the cost of the equipment used in one of these Hong Kong or other commercial farms? Well, we gave you, Charlie, we told you what the Hong Kong farm spent. They spent 250000 US. Um, the farm in um, Oman spent about 800000 US with the expansion. But you see, it's very difficult and troublesome for me to quote figures like that because depending on where you live, the price will vary greatly. If you're here in Australia, it costs you a whole lot more. Dearest country in the world to do anything, um, unfortunately. So there you go. Um, we like to tell people for a ballpark figure, if you're building in the USA, for example, and you're going to do it properly with good new materials, you're going to buy a good greenhouse, you're going to do all that sort of thing, you need to budget on 250000 US per square metre. Sorry, $250, not 1000 sorry. $250 per square metre. Now, I don't know what that is in square feet. That's $250, about 10 square feet. Of, of greenhouse area with all built out. So that's what you need to do. But of course, if you are going to use second-hand materials or you, you're a smart buyer, you'll do it for a lot less than that. Fernandez says, are you going to have your next course after this one in July, in September? I'm not in a position to take the July course right now. Fernando, sorry, we haven't set the date for the next aquaponics design course. Uh, we may run another one this year. I don't know. It just depends on how exhausted I am after this one. But yeah, sorry about that. Can't really give you a date right now. Um, Gerson in, says, I'm from Brazil. I like a lot of your videos and your course. Thanks, Gerson. Have you done the course already? Or are you planning on doing it? <clears throat> do we do smaller ba basic courses, Mar Martin? Asked, do we do smaller basic courses? Sorry, Martin, no, we don't. We actually thought about that for a while, but then we realised, well, you know, how basic do you want to go? I mean, I don't know. Maybe we should. I don't know. If someone gives us a good reason to do it, we probably should do it. I don't know. Nancy asks, hello Murray, good morning. Hello to you too, Nancy. Can you grow lettuce and laminia? 
I don't even know what that is, sorry. Alberto asks, yes, we certainly grow lettuce, there's no doubt about that. Hi Murray, I'm Ari from Suriname and have an aquaponics farm and I have a little problem with my pH, it's dropping below 5.5, what can be the problem? Uh, that's a natural thing that happens, um, add. That's what happens, you have to buffer the system up and we tell you how to do that in our aquaponics design course. You have to use something like calcium carbonate to buffer the system up so that you keep the pH above. It's perfectly natural for the system to lower in pH all by itself. Uh, Sapiro says, can you use square tanks? About 40 foot long. Well, you can, but gee, they're awful big. You'd find it hard to control tanks that are that long and that big, because you're going to have a really big, big system. Uh, and you'll only want to do that if you're going to be fish centric. You know, you're going to have a lot of fish. Uh, too many fish is not good. You know, you have to have a system in balance. Unfortunately, we just went to a place in uh, in Asia. I went to do a, I won't mention where it was. I went to do a, a consultancy there recently and they just wanted to grow fish. That's all they wanted to do. And they thought by adding some kind of magic thing to it called aquaponics, it would make all their fish problems go away. But unfortunately, it doesn't. You have to have it in balance. You have to have the right number of fish for the right number of grow beds and we teach all that in our design course. If you want to grow a whole pile of fish and that's all you're interested in, then my advice to you is just go and do aquaculture. Uh, there's someone written there in a foreign language, which I'm sorry I can't read. Uh, Charlie Harper says, Hey Murray, can you give us a ballpark figure of the cost of equipment? Didn't I already answer that one? I thought I did. Valerie, are these talks being recorded? Yes, you'll find it'll be on Facebook after we've finished. No worries, Brad. Hello, hello. Let us know how we can support the Oregon Training Centre. Yes, Jesse. Um, if you send me an email, I can give you the name of our contact there, if you like, so that you can contact, her name's Kate, Kate Waldrick. Uh, Jonathan Sands, thanks for the live stream tonight. Yeah, Jason, I'm in WA, is that Western Australia? Yeah, must be Pollowop, Jason, in Western Australia. There's got a whole lot of towns in Western Australia, all, all ending in up. <clears throat> um, John Sylvia asked, do you have a, have a favourite material that seems to be more forgiving when considering media beds or raft systems? It depends on where you are and what your budget is. We, we show on our plans building out of wood. And the reason we do that is because wood is available to most people in most places around the world. You've got to remember we're talking to people who are currently from 93 countries. So every country is different. But if you had an unlimited budget and you're going to do it the very best way, you'd build everything in fiberglass. It's just that simple. Fiberglass will last 50 years plus. It's infinitely repairable. You can repair it no matter what happens to it. Someone runs into it with a tractor and breaks one of the beds, you can repair it, uh, and on and on it goes. But fiberglass is not easy to work with unless you've got those skills, and it's more expensive. So that's why we do um, that. So Ad says, thanks for the course. Have you done the course, Ad? Good on you. No worries. Um, good morning. I have a problem with the pH drop down to 5. I used to add to the system, but it's still not effect. Well, you're not doing it enough to get it to come up. It's not a once-only thing. We find in large systems, um, the pH may need to be adjusted every second day. That's how often it happens. So if you've got a vigorous system that's running really, really well, the pH will want to drop. That's what will happen. Um, so, yeah. You're not going to get the pH to totally stabilise. It's just the way it is. It, it drops and then it has to be kicked up again and so on. How to add the, the iron, the uh, calcium and the uh, potassium. Yes, you add them at the furthest point away from the fish tank. The last thing you want is to have the fish tank getting a, a flush of alkaline material running into it and the fish swimming through it. It's not good for them. Okay, look, I've got to scroll down because we're nearly out of time. I said I'd do this for an hour. Where I didn't find that in the course, Ad says, what are, you, what are you looking for again? Sorry, I've lost track of what you're talking about. Um, you did the course... What were you looking for? Or how to get the pH to come down. I think that's what you asked, if I'm right. Um, the pH will come down all by itself. It just You just have to have patience. And that's one of the wonderful things about gardening and dealing with plants and animals. You have to learn to be patient. You really have to, and to let nature take its course. And I know, in this modern world, we want instant solutions to everything. How can I find out how much the course costs, Valerie says? Download the PDF file that I had opened. I've got it open right here in front of you right now. Look, I'll just switch back to it for a second. Um, there it is there. Can you see it now? It's got to do this. Yep, there it is right there. 
So you can see there, and I'll let you know, I shouldn't do this because you shouldn't know the price until you know all the benefits. There you go. It's not good for people. They make decisions about the price. When not See, look at all those things we teach you. Look at all the videos there. Isn't it what makes our course so good? There you go. Blah, 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 blah. And we'll get right down to the bottom here in a minute with all the pictures. Course graduates. These are people who have done the course. I'm nearly at the bottom. There's a picture of Arvind. What a great guy he is. There's the two lads from Korea. There's all their staff. Have a look at that. There's some of there's some of the um, submissions our students make. At the end, if you want to get a certificate, we ask you to submit a design. Uh, there you go. Look more of them. Some some people do some amazing designs. You can see this one's hand drawn using uh, pencil and paper. I've done a beautiful job. This one over here is drawn using um, AutoCAD or something like that. <clears throat> There's more designs. Look at this one, how elaborate it is. And there's the certificate you get issued with at the end. I'm just getting down to it. Here we are, eight weeks course. And this is what you get, what you get. Eight week course. Aquaponics triple pack DVDs, you get to download that. Weekly conference calls. I didn't mention that. Every week I get on and we have a conference call just like this where you can ask questions audibly, you know, not written questions. Um, weekly course PDFs, design assessment, certification. There you go. I've told you the price. 997 that is US dollars. And the reason we price in US dollars is because we get students from all over the world and it's a lot easier for students to pay for it in US dollars than it is to pay for it in any other thing we find. Okay, well, I hope that answers your question. A lot of people are asking, how much is the course? How much is the course? There you go, I've told you now, I've let the secret out. Can a media bed be 16 foot long or should it be limited to 8 feet to accommodate the flood and drain? 16 feet or 4.8 metres is as long as you can go. We've done lots of tests on that. You're right at the outside at 16 feet. That's the very limit of a, a go to have the auto siphon work properly. Will this be viewable afterwards, Dwight says? Yes, it will. No problems. Um, I better scroll down here because we're running out of time. Mark says, you have answered the question about high pH and well water, and I would like to know about the EWDHA. Would it be any advantage to treat the makeup water with acid or something? If you start treating the makeup water with acid, particularly if you use hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid, when it disassociates, you know, when it uses up the carbonates, what it does, it leaves behind salt. So you can wind up with a lot of salt in the system, which is not good. So if you've got high pH water, you know, this is one of the things we tell you in the course. When you're going to build a farm, especially if you're going to build a farm, do your due diligence. And one of the things you need to do due diligence on is the water source. We know of a farm in California that actually had to pull up stakes and move in the end because they had well water that was so high pH. They started treating the water in separate tanks before they put it into the system with hydrochloric acid. The water wound up being so salty they went and bought a very expensive reverse osmosis machine to try and get rid of the salt, which they could. But they ended up with such high running costs, it was ridiculous. They finally figured it out they were better to move. And they actually pulled up stakes after a year and a half. That farm was running okay, except they had problems with the pH. And they moved to a new location. So due diligence on your water. Now, if you're in a home system and you've got no choice about it, then you're just going to have to live with it. Let the pH come down. And I gave you the tip before, and this is a, a real good secret, and that is to use E double D H A. Iron chelates or chelates, depends on how you want to say it, uh, because they will operate and give the plant the iron it needs up to a pH of about 9. In fact, some scientific documents say up to 11, a pH 11. And there are other things that that does too, which we discuss in the course, which is really, really interesting, uh, how iron chelates will help the whole system, not just with iron. So there you go. Uh, now, I'll just try and get the last few questions in. Uh, do you have a favourite material that seems to be more forgiving? We've done that one. Thank you for the great information you put out. I've had a system for a few years now, and this year my pH has tested at 7.8 several times. What upper level? We've just covered that, Aaron, up 11 to 7.8. If you're using EWHA, you'll get by it. Gilbert says, Hi, Murray, how expensive can the heating cost be? I can't answer that, mate. I'd love to be able to answer it. Depends where you live. I went to go and see a farm in uh, Wyoming about four years ago, five years ago. And when I got there, it was at Laramie, Wyoming. I was really fascinated to go there, actually, because when I was a young kid, back when the television was still black and white, there was a cowboy show called Laramie. I thought, wow, I'm here. <laughs> but anyway, they had a farm built there, and they were doing very well. They were selling all their produce as much as they could grow. 
they were spending $1,800 a month on gas to heat the water because it gets pretty darn cold in Wyoming in wintertime. And they were just um, in the middle of putting in a new, quite fancy wooden furnace to cut that cost down because they did their numbers and figured they could cut it in half by heating it with wood. But, you know, if you live in a really cold place, it's going to cost you money to heat. And I've got to tell you, it's a lot harder to heat than it is to cool. So living in places that are really cold, your expenses are going to be high. And it depends on what you call cold. I mean, here in winter in Brisbane, a cold day for us is Fahrenheit 45. We think it's dreadful, 45. We're all putting our cardings on and complaining about the cold. But, you know, in other places of the world, minus 20, they think it's not a bad sort of a day. Uh, John says, I loved your idea about the compost heating. Yes, that will work. <coughs> but you've got to have a lot of it. Let me tell you, there's a person, and you should write this down. This is a good tip. Uh, do some Googling for a fellow called Gene Payne. That's J-E-A-N, Payne, as in pain in the neck, P-A-I-N. And Gene Payne has got a PDF file you'll find online that will tell you how to do it and do it properly using compost. So there you go. That's a good tip for today. <clears throat> okay, last couple of questions. <clears throat> Hi, Mary. Is it possible to avoid nutrient deficiencies by only using a mix of out of, of soldier fly larvae, worms and duckweed as fish food instead of supplements? No. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> Felix, just let me have a drink of water before I answer this one. Um, Felix, um, you won't avoid nutrient deficiencies like that, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> When you feed fish on, on natural food like that, it's not as potent as fish pellets. So you will have some nutrient deficiencies unless you pump a mile of food into them, more than they'll probably eat. So the best way to make up for the nutrient deficiencies is to use either seaweed extract, kelp powder, or if you really want to do it really, really well and be true to nature, make compost and compost tea and worm tea. That's the way to go. And you'll supplement your stuff pretty well. Yes, Justin says it's finally been labelled. Actually, I had the privilege of being at an aquaponics association meeting in Oregon uh, back in November last year when there was a person there from the one of the officials from the USDA and he made the announcement there at that conference. And mind you, before that, people were getting their farms registered, but there was actually a bit of a stink created uh, by some other industries mm -hmm. who wanted to be, um, be able to get organic certification. So they uh, conducted quite a campaign with the USDA uh, saying that aquaponics is very dangerous because they grow their vegetables in manure. They deliberately use the word manure to make it sound as terrible as possible. So then the whole system was reviewed by the USDA, which was a good thing in the end because they actually took in some good information. They held a lot of um, industry um, you know, consultancy and they came out and say, yes, under the USDA, the USDA rules, aquaponics can be organically certified. Not a problem. John's talking about many stores supply them, but bait and tackle shops as well. I don't know what you're talking about, John, but anyway, it must be answering someone else's question. <coughs> uh, Valerie says he's loving the Wednesday talk. That's great, Valerie. Thanks for coming and logging in. <coughs> Love the idea, John says, of the compost heating. Uh, yep, well, I think we're right down to the end of the questions now. Um, is it recognised in Australia as organic? It can be. Believe it or not, you know, you can get organic certification in Australia by hiring a USDA certified certifier and getting it done in Australia. Not a problem. Um, in Australia, you've got to, and this might sound terrible, but you've got to certify shop. You've got to find a certifier who understands the rules. And that might sound, you might think, how's that possible? All the rules are the same. But each certifier will interpret them um, in their own mind as what they think it's right or wrong. Uh, and we've done the ring around here in Australia. We found a few certifiers that will do it. And we've found some that say, no way will we certify anything that's not grown in soil. Uh, the other certifiers that we convinced was a good idea, they, we convinced them that our media beds were actually soil, rough soil, pretty coarse, but soil nonetheless. It has all the properties that good soil does. So there you go. Uh, Neil says, this course is absolutely awesome, worth every penny, just finished it. Good on you, Neil. Thanks for getting in there. The last question we answered, just finished, absolutely amazing. I went through knowing next to nothing, highly recommend it. Thanks for saying that, Neil. And we didn't pay him to do that. If you're wondering what other students think, I encourage you now to go to my personal website, aquaponics.net.au, and have a look there under Learn Aquaponics, and you'll see a place called What Our Students Say. There we've got over 200 students' uh, testimonials uh, about the course. And you know, some people put testimonials on their website and they're fakes, and that's why I put up 250 of them. 
because you might be able to fake three or four testimonials, but I'm telling you what, you can't fake 240 of them. And there are more yet we still haven't put up. So go to that, aquaponics.net.au and see what our other students have said. Now, finally, just the last thing. Please remember, July the 1st, that's Sunday, Australian time, Saturday evening, USA time, uh, you'll find the course will open on Aquaponics Design Course. That's one long word, aquaponicsdesigncourse.com, and you'll be able to go there and you'll be able to register for the course. And I'm telling you, I absolutely guarantee you will not regret it. Sorry, Murray, crickets can be used as a help with fish food. Yeah, they can, yeah. There's all sorts of things you can feed fish on, but you have to make a choice. Is it going to be something that's easy to do or is it going to be something that's going to be a lot of work? And if you start, if you get in the road wanting to feed your fish on worms and crickets and all that sort of thing, it's all very nice uh, idea, but you'll find you'll be doing hours and hours of work gathering all the food to feed the fish. Okay. Oh, Desiree says she lives in Gympie. Nice to hear a local just up the road. She's going to take the course. <clears throat> okay. Well, I hope you can, Desiree. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much for coming. See you next time.